Okay, so we're going to start off by thinking about what is trauma. Okay, so individual trauma results from a, an event or a series of events that basically threatens a person and makes them feel like their life is at risk. Um, or that is emotionally or physically harmful to them or going to be potentially emotionally or physically, physically harmful to them. It has lasting effects on their emotional, social, spiritual, physical uh, well-being. This can also happen for somebody's caregiver. So if a child has witnessed something that happens to their primary caregiver and they are frightened for their life or for their emotional or physical well-being, that is also traumatising because it's their caregiver, it's the person that needs their needs. So if they die or they're at risk, then the child is also at risk. Does that kind of make sense for everyone? Okay, so complex trauma is when um, there are chronic or multiple events. And this will be for, say, a victim of domestic violence or someone who's experienced war. So things that are going on that make that person feel like they are at different times at risk of death or harm, serious harm. Also, think about bullying. It's repetitive uh, trauma when someone feels that they're at risk of being physically or emotionally hurt. Now, developmental trauma, which is uh, where I kind of specialise, um, is the impact of early repeated abuse ne or neglect, uh, domestic <coughs> violence, witnessing domestic violence, um, physical abuse, emotional um, separation, and just general adverse experiences that happen within the child's important relationships. So it happens early on, and it can happen when. Um, if it, so basically, if a significant caregiver is also a, a, a source of fear, that can cause developmental trauma. If uh, a caregiver is warm and secure and loving, but they are um, being abused or uh, witnessing horrific things, then that can also be cause developmental trauma. And the difference is that it affects the way that the brain develops, the way that the child makes relationships, the way that the child sees the world and sees themselves. That's how it links in with attachment, but I'll come back to that a lot more in a minute. <coughs> okay, people are always really surprised. Um, I've spoken to parents, um, mums who have said, yes, I was a victim of domestic violence, but I got out of there. When the baby was born, we left and we went away. I can't understand why my child still seems traumatised or is showing symptoms of developmental trauma. Unfortunately, even pre-conception, um, unborn babies can suffer trauma and it can affect the way that their brains develop. So this can, yeah, even if a child in a relatively safe and stable environment, that impact on their developing brain in the womb can be really, really, or have a huge impact. So developmental trauma is more likely to occur when a birth mother is in a violent relationship, uses alcohol or substances, had their own trauma history, or serious mental health problems. And this, this is really important because actually what's going on is that what the mum releases when they're in a state of terror or when they're in a state of high stress is cortisol and adrenaline. The stress, you probably heard of those, cortisol and adrenaline. They're the stress hormones and they can have a huge impact on our own bodies, let alone the brain of a developing fetus. So the child can be born sort of hardwired for stress hardwired to go into fight or flight to respond to a stressful environment. It's kind of like evolution, but really quick speed up evolution. Um, so epigenetics can even change. So we've got examples of people who survived the Holocaust, um, people whose, whose very lives are incredibly stressful and traumatic. And then the generations that come after, those babies are born with their genes having been kind of activated so it's called epigenetics, when genes can get turned on or off to be more hardwired for trauma. What that means is that they are ready to fight or flee more readily, but it also means that they're more um, easily stressed. So they see the world, they see normal things as more stressful. So if you've got a child that has had intergenerational trauma, so if their parents and their parents' parents have kind of struggled with adverse childhood experiences, um, and then they also grow up in an environment that is traumatic, 
you've got a child that is really, really, really stuck in their brainstem. They are literally all about surviving. We've got from here, we've got abuse, physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, physical and emotional, household dysfunction. I think what's interesting is here we've got mental illness, incarcerated relative. It's a bit gender. So the mother treated violently. Well, I've got lots of children in camp, so the father's been treated violently. So, um, divorce, substance abuse, all of this can have an impact on how safe the child feels. So trauma is about not feeling safe. Attachment is about safety-seeking behaviours. So put trauma on attachment and you get a child who doesn't feel safe, who constantly needs to use safety-seeking behaviours to make themselves feel safe. So people tend to think that um, once these situations, these adverse childhood experiences have happened, uh, the, you know, brain development has been affected, that's it. Actually, no, the brain, uh, you know, children's brains especially are very plastic, there's brain plasticity, they can be rewired, um, we can make a big difference through relationships, through um, creating safety. Um, but that's just an example of what can happen when help isn't given and how cycles can just be repeated over and over and that intergenerational trauma can be continued. Um, it's also something really important to think about when people um, do the ACEs training. Very often if it's parents doing it, it can be quite traumatic to suddenly realise that the childhood, you know, that that kind of, you know, didn't do me any harm attitude, suddenly it actually it did. It caused a lot of problems and issues and this can cause a lot of physiological problems too and that can be quite traumatic and hard for people to manage so if you do are working alongside anyone who's going through the ACEs training you know if you can offer some kind of like support around how difficult it can be even if it's just a little bit of empathy around you know, how hard it is to make sense of some of your early years. Okay so the known risks and consequences of ACEs it can lead to certain types of behaviours uh, coping strategies, um, a lack of physical activity, a sense of, you know, when bad things happen to children, it makes children think that they are bad. We've used something called internal working models, um, we think about this in attachment, where attachment is a blueprint, you know, how you are treated, if you've had a warm, safe, nurturing, loving caregiver who keeps you feeling really safe, meets all your needs when you, when you need them. That develops trust and it builds a blueprint for how the child views themselves, i.e. As, as that as valuable, as worthy of love, as worthy of getting their needs met, or as unworthy and unlovable. Um, it also creates a sense of what the, world, the wider world is going to be. Do these children can either grow up thinking the world is a good place, and that they will get their needs met and they can take risks, or they might grow up thinking the world is a hostile, dangerous, scary place. So that's why attachment is really important and trauma impacts on attachment and how we relate to other people, how we develop relationships. So behaviours, using smoking and alcoholism, <coughs> drug use, all a way of dumbing down and kind of cutting off from pain, but also as a way of seeking reward. Have you all heard of dopamine? You have reward centres in your brain that releases dopamine when you do something that is deemed as pleasurable. So smoking, alcoholism, drug use, they can make you feel just for a moment that you're, you're okay, that you're worthy. So when you've got high levels of shame, we think about looked after children, we often hear in camps, oh my goodness, they just raid the larder, they won't stop eating. Yes, that comes from the fact that they haven't been fed properly and they're never sure they're going to get their next meal. But it also comes from a sense of, because they're still sugar, probably not apples, um, from a sense of wanting to feel good for a moment. So it comes very much, and as they grow up, they'll probably look more into drinking and smoking. So that's about self-worth. Physical and mental health, well, I think it's the children who've had um, childhood adverse experiences are about four times more likely to develop heart disease. Um, I think they're seven times more likely to be an alcoholic. But some of them are really, 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 really high multiplications. We've got here broken bones. You know, the, when you're under toxic stress, so not just a big traumatic, traumatic incident that's happened several times in the childhood or early years, when it's something that is a constant murmur of stress, that constant shouting, constant arguing, parents who are always a bit dismissive, a little bit uh, rejecting, then that creates a, um, 
that affects the attachment style, but it also affects your releasing of cortisol and it, um, releasing of adrenaline. They get you ready to kind of fight or flight, but um, in too many quantities, too much quantity, they can affect you know how your bones absorb calcium and how we age. They are they have a really direct impact on how we function, um, and they can be quite debilitating. Yeah. So we're looking to reduce toxic stress, even you know that kind of constant rumble of it doesn't have to be really severe domestic abuse, but just that constant controlling or constant kind of nasty. It doesn't always have to be really, really severe. That's my point. It can just be constant. Okay, so the way that the brain develops is bottom up. Um, I like to think of babies' brains as a kind of, you, you know, half baked bread, half baked bread. You buy it and it's already been a little bit baked, but you have to then put it in the oven to cook it. Babies' brains are a little bit like that. They're born with their like survival mechanisms in place, ready to go, you know, to keep them alive. But the rest of it hasn't happened yet. They need to be cooked. And that happens through relationships. So warm, attuned, loving, secure, safe, responsive caregiving enables these parts of the brain to properly develop and to be populated by all those branches. So the first bit that develops is the brain stem, that's your sensory, motor and survival. Next to develop is your limbic system, that's your attachment, it's where you, um, your emotional development, how you learn to regulate your emotions, regulate your behaviours, but also where you lay down memories. So very often children with developmental trauma, and adults, because I'm sure you'll be working with parents who are struggling with developmental trauma, they will struggle to lay down memories. And so they might feel like in a moment of where they've just gone into fight or flight mode, i.e. back down in their limbic system, back down in their brainstem, they actually then afterwards can't remember what they've done or said. And we'll be like, no, I didn't say that. Of course I didn't do that. Which can make, we, you know, as carers and support workers and teachers, it can be like, oh my goodness, they're just blatantly lying. Actually, they don't remember. The next bit too, or the last bit to develop is the, is the neocortex. It's the bit that makes us human. It's the human part of the brain. It's what separates us. It's the bit that gives us reasoning, <laughs> rationale. It's a bit that's about, it's about thinking and learning. And it's also about inhibiting. So this is the bit up here that helps regulate these bits down here. So it's the bit that goes, oh, I'm feeling really, really angry. Give yourself five seconds. You know, I'm sure there's another reason for this. I need to think about this a little bit more clearly. If this part of the brain hasn't actually been fully formed, children can't make good choices. They're going to be going from their instinctive part of their brain, which is here. Because that's the bit that works really, really well. That's the bit that keeps them alive. And very often when children haven't had their needs met, all they care about is staying alive. So for them staying alive physically, but also staying alive emotionally, being emotionally safe, keeping themselves kind of present in the minds of their caregiver is vitally important to them. So whether it's through good behaviour, bad behaviour, as long as they keep you thinking about them, that's what they're going to be doing. So they're not going to be able to make those good choices. We have to help them work their way through. So you'll get children who are chronologically 14, 15 years old. This should all be developed. You know, this goes on, I think, about 18 to 25 hour, uh, uh, that, that part of the brain is fully developed. And if you think about um, criminal responsibility, the age of criminal responsibility is 10 years old. It's interesting, isn't it? And the ability for us to make choices and rationalize and that doesn't really become fully formed until 18 to 25. So for a child with developmental trauma, they really aren't in a place to be able to do that. They're still kind of babies. They're that egocentric, I need my needs met. Very often they haven't developed empathy. They don't even have theory of mind. They don't even know that you've got needs, wishes, desires, dreams that are different from theirs. Another really good book for trauma is Trauma is Really Strange by Steve Haynes. It's a really easy to read. Um, kind of pictorial, it's more like a, a cartoon, but it's fantastic and it's really good for children and for trauma pe people who've experienced trauma to take it in because very often the very people that we're trying to teach haven't got the ability to take in and hold on to the piece of information that we're giving, psychoeducation. Yes. What was the book called again, please? 
The second one yeah. is Trauma is Really Strange yeah. by Steve Haynes. That's H-A-Y-N-E-S. <coughs> So, I'm going to come back to um, this lady who was talking about we work with asylum seekers. What we found in camps is that very often people have experienced horrific complex trauma, like war, and then, you know, children that have been unaccompanied and travelling on their own, they've had horrendous things happen to them. They can actually be stabilised much more quickly and have um, trauma therapy more quickly, and it works more efficiently and effectively because they've got that foundation, they've got, uh, they've had good attachment, they've, um, you know, originally they saw the world as a safe place. So even though these traumatic events have happened, they're more easy to fix, if you like, even though I don't really like to use that terminology. So if you think about it, it's a little bit like Jenga. You've got a Jenga model, uh, and you imagine a Jenga where it's really top heavy and it's got loads of bits missing from the bottom. All those areas that are really important for the foundation just haven't happened. It's a little bit like that picture of the brain. Instead of it developing naturally bottom up, it's been patchy and bits and pieces. People with developmental trauma really struggle to make sense of things. So many things have been impacted throughout their development at different stages, but it's like so I, I know so as a therapist, some of my clients will talk about having a Swiss cheese brain and they've got holes, just bits missing, memories missing, things don't make sense, they've got sensory images and fractured bits of information and they don't have a cohesive, coherent sense of their life or their story. And that's because there are seven pieces of the developmental trauma puzzle, but sensory development, <coughs> people always think that sensory issues are autism. It's, it doesn't work that way. So, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. I'm trying to bring everything in here. Yeah. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder and as such will affect development. So it will affect sensory issues. But trauma can do the same. So it will have a, can have a really big impact on the way that a child uh, makes sense of their environment, how they take in information. How many children do you know with trauma, who've experienced trauma, who wear a coat when it's hot and who run around in a t-shirt when it's cold? I don't know if you've experienced that. It's like their internal thermometers are just a little bit off whack. Um, but it's also something to do with uh, safety. So they might wear big things in the summer because it feels safe because they want to hide. And they actually can't feel the change in temperature. <coughs> One thing that trauma does is because it's... Um, Adrenaline and cortisol will go to different parts of your body to enable you to get ready to run away or to fight an imminent danger. That has a real effect on your bodily processes. So your muscles get primed and ready to fight. Um, your blood goes to your extremities so you can run away. And it means that you might find that the children that you work with have, and parents that you work with, have digestion issues and constipation because Everything slows down, everything's out in the extremities, nothing's moving through. So the amount of times at camps we get children who come in with chronic, sorry to be honest, constipation, really, really struggle with their, with their digestion. And often it's because they're in a constant state of fight or flight or freeze. So it can affect their senses, how they perceive things, their pre perception. It can affect, do you remember when Bess was talking about that dampening down? That's dissociation, that's freeze, that's when a child just goes into kind of playing dead. They can feel separate from their body. I think trauma survivors, sexual abuse survivors talk about floating above what was going on. This can lead to really, really complex issues like identity disorders, um, dissociative identity disorders. But it's basically cutting off from what's going on, from your senses, from your body. And as the video said, it can be about, you know, you can get people who present with depression, actually, they just, they don't feel anything. So they don't take enjoyment in anything. So it can look very much like clinical depression, but actually it doesn't respond to treatment. So people who've experienced long-term trauma present with depression, but then they're resistant to a treatment. So all of these things can be affected, the way that we attach, the way that we relate to people, the way that we build, we feel trust and build trust, the way that we manage to regulate our emotions. I don't know if I've
talked to any of you before if you've ever heard me talk about emotional regulation and soothing babies. Have you ever seen me do my little rocking? Great, none of you know it. Okay, so basically, one thing, you know when you, when you hold a crying baby, everyone, I think men as well as women, will tend to automatically rock from side to side and rub the baby's back and make shushing noises and maybe do a little sing-song voice and lots of white noise. None of that affects the baby whatsoever. <laughs> okay, none of that. What it does is it calms you down. <laughs> So I'm on camera at the moment, so I'm kind of standing here doing this quite a lot, I'm really aware. Um, it calms you down, it, it enables you to slow your heart rate, for you to calm your breathing, and for you to change your brain activity. This is what the baby responds to, your altered state. So their lungs, their breathing, their heart rate, their brain activity will sync with yours. Now it's even better when they're babies because you're, you've got them skin to skin, which is why it's so amazing when babies put straight on the chest of their mums or their dads um, after birth. But it doesn't mean that you can't help somebody to emotionally regulate when they're not touching you. You can have someone next to you and just by actively self-soothing next to them, that will help them to calm down. If you say to a child, why have you just calmed down? They're never, ever going to be able to learn how to calm down. So when we objectively look at children and say, well, they just have got no emotional regulation, they should have that by now at age seven, eight. Actually, if they've never been taught that, if they've never had a person self-soothe alongside them, they're never going to learn it. And because it's instinctive, like none of you knew that, unless you know it, you can't do it. So if a mum grows up having had constant violence and constant abuse when she was growing up, she's never going to know emotional regulation herself. So it's up to us, I suppose, as carers, teachers, nurses, therapists, to actively self-soothe when we're with children. Because what happens is they sink with us and they calm down, and over time they learn these skills for self-soothing. Otherwise they develop anti-social self-soothing behaviours um, which aren't always particularly appropriate um, you know I don't know if you've you worked with a lot of looked after children I'm a ch child and care therapist so I work with a lot of looked after children and you can get some really unusual self-soothing behaviours um, masturbation in classrooms things like that uh, it feels it feels like it's soothing to them but actually if they're around someone who's calm and considered and thoughtful and safe they start to learn it for themselves. So that's really important. Behavioural regulation kind of comes next. Once a child, there's a difference between shame and guilt. Children who've experienced bad things think they are bad. Remember that internal working model I think I mentioned? That blueprint for how you see yourself. If you've received tender loving care, you will believe that you're worthy of that. If you haven't, you will believe that you are a bad person, and that is shame. And children will do anything they can to avoid feeling shame, because it is horrible. We all know what it's like when we've done something wrong. It's a horrible feeling. We want to get away from it as quickly as possible, and we'll do lots of different things to try and get away from it. Denial, minimise, it wasn't me, I'm awful, oh, this always happens to me. Whatever it is, we would all have our little way of dealing with shame. Children who feel intrinsic shame, that they are very, very bad people indeed. They really, really struggle with behavioural regulation because they haven't got the empathy bit, because they can't go there, they can't touch their own empathy, they can't go to their feelings. So they can't for a minute feel like what it's like for somebody else. That means them having to get in touch with their own stuff. So guilt, which is basically shame, but with empathy, like, oh, I feel really bad for doing that because it impacted on you. That's going to be missing. So behavioural regulation is going to be tricky. Also, children who are feeling in fight, flight, freeze. In fact, what do you think? When a child isn't feeling safe, what does it look like? Can anyone give me some examples of what it looks Lash. like? Lash out. Lash out, yeah. Yeah. Hide. Hide. Run away. Impulsive. Yeah. Yes, impulsive. Someone said this morning they're in control. They try to be in control. And I think that's a really, really big one, isn't it? Children who are 
uh, traumatised, don't feel safe. They don't trust adults to keep them safe. They don't trust their environment to be safe. So they have to be the ones that are in control. Only they can keep themselves safe in their minds. So if they're the only ones that can keep themselves safe and they need to be super controlling in relationships and make things predictable because they're in control, if you tell them no, that means you're in control. And they will really, really struggle with anything top down, anything authoritarian will uh, threaten that sense of predictability and control that they have or they need to put on their environment. So behavioural regulation becomes really tricky with children who've experienced trauma. Um, and we have to use a certain way of working with that, which is more about empathy, more about connection. Because all of it is about relationships. This is where things have gone wrong, is through relationships. So it's through relationships that we put things right. We help children to feel safe. Once we've achieved these things, we can then start helping them work on that. Remember, it was in blue, the neocortex, the human part of the brain. Then we can start helping them make those choices, and those good choices. Then we can help them a little bit more with that identity and that kind of self-esteem, self-worth, and you know, ability to look outwards instead of inwards. The ability to come out of that survival mode and into thrive mode. Yeah. So. Developmental trauma affects all those different things. And it can, depending on where a child is at, we need to work out where a child is at, actually, before we can do any kind of help at all. If we, if we just look at a child as being 14 or 15 or 7 or 8 and go, you should be able to do this by now, therefore you are willfully not doing it. That's not how it works. If these things have been impacted by trauma, they physically cannot do what you're asking them to do. And we need to work on that. If the brain <coughs> develops upwards in a bottom-up way, we need to work in a bottom-up way to support that. Unfortunately, I only have an hour today. I could go on about this for days, but um, I'll have to keep it to that and move on to the next bit. So in ta attachment, I'm trying to kind of talk about developmental trauma and attachment like this. The two impact on each other massively. Trauma affects your feelings of safety. Attachment is how you keep yourself safe. So attachment styles are your ways, your strategies that we all develop to maintain emotional and physical safety. Yeah? So a secure base is where a parent supports exploration. They watch over the child, delight in the child, help the child and enjoy things with the child. That shared experience, that reciprocity, that is what creates, the, that's what cooks the brain. <laughs> that's what cooks the bread. Those experiences. The child needs you, the, the caregiver, to welcome the child coming to them, protect them, comfort them, delight in them, and organise their feelings. Oh no, you fell over, that must hurt, and oh, it was probably a bit of a shock, wasn't it? You weren't expecting that. Children who haven't had that don't know that they don't have a vocabulary for all those different feelings that goes around falling over. Normally there's masses of embarrassment and everything else, not just pain and suffering. So being able to help a child organise their feelings, make sense of their feelings, that's vital when you're caring for a child with developmental trauma, because it wouldn't have been done. So I've mentioned the working model. Primary care is behaviour towards a child, affects the child's internal working model. If they've felt positive and loved, then they will have a secure <coughs> internal working model. They'll believe that they're worthy and they're able to go out into the world and the world will be good to them. They'll be able to ask for a pay rise. They'll be able to take risks and expect good things to happen. If the child has felt unloved and rejected, so if the parent has been cold, rejecting, that often takes them down that avoidance side. So those of you who've studied a bit of attachment, it's that avoidance side, that self-sufficient, I'm okay, I don't need you, I can do it myself. Those children who are little carers, young carers, uh, children who just crack on, do what's necessary, never complain. The ones that are compulsive in their caregiving. That can also come about from interfering parenting as well. So a parent who's misattuned, who just doesn't get what the needs are and does the wrong support at the wrong time. Um, if a child feels angry and confused, if a parent has been um, uh, inconsistent, so looking at parental mental health issues, 
um, thinking about drug use. Um, if a parent is sometimes emotionally available and sometimes not, then that child will end up ambivalent. Ambivalent, they rely on keeping themselves in your mind, keeping them alive, keeping themselves alive through their caregiver. So the avoidant in the, is in the name, they avoid kind of relationships to keep them safe, and ambivalent, it's all about the other, it's all about other people. So you get that little push and pull with ambivalent. It also makes a child very clingy or very behavioural. You know, they need to keep themselves really, really in front of your mind. Ambivalent is more about feelings. Avoidant is more cognitive. So you often find people end up more dissociative if they're avoidant. They cut off and they go more into their brain, less into their bodies. Anything anyone's struggling with or not sure about? Is this making sense of attachment a bit more? It took me years to get attachment. <coughs> okay, so what they try to do with this slide is to merge two sides together. So we've got two, this is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Has anyone come across this before? Good, I'm loving all the nods. Okay, so we know that a child needs the physiological safety of food, water, sleep, breathing, health. We all need that to be able to survive. Next, and crucially, is safety. Security of body, employment, resources, morality, family, property, health. All these things are essential. And the reason why this is in a triangle is because it's, it's like stepping stones. You can't step to there unless this is sorted. You can't step to there unless this is sorted. Does that make sense? So safety isn't just about being safe. As we know from children in care who are completely safe, yet they react as though they aren't safe. Safety is about feeling safe. It's about psychological safety. It's about emotional safety. And it's very different. How do you think we sort of already identified how children are sometimes when they don't feel safe? How do you think we can provide safety or emotional safety for children, a sense of safety? Yeah. Very much so. Predictability. Knowing what's going to happen. Very often for these children, things have just happened out of the blue, their lives have been chaotic and they're going to know what's going to happen next. So safety is consistency, predictability, routine, structures, boundaries. Acknowledging their emotions, actually noticing and recognising them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a connection. So there's something about, before you can even have any of the love, belonging, friendship, it's that initial connection, isn't there? It's that feeling like someone's heard you and they understand you. Okay. Once we've got that sorted, then children can start to look out from the caregiver, where they are, at the, until that point, focused on getting their needs met and surviving. You're going to meet my needs. I'm all about you. Or, if they're avoidant, I will meet my own needs, I'm all about me. Once we've got them out of that and they're feeling safer, they can start to look outwards and they can start to be more playful, they can start to be more exploratory, and they can start looking more outside to peers, to social interaction, and they can start to have affection with people, they can start to basically trust. Because predictability is not okay just as a one-off, it needs to be over and over and over and over again so that a child builds trust because they've had years often of entrenched this is the way the world works and you're coming along and saying no that's not the way it is at all you need to prove that again and again and again so this is not a you know these are things that do not take five seconds they take a long time they're much quicker for people who've got good attachment and not had developmental trauma because actually, even if you've got the best attachment in the world and you've had the best start in life, if something traumatic happens, you'll go straight back down to the bottom of the, the triangle, but you will come up quicker. But once you get stuck there, not feeling safe, you're going to need some sort of intervention. Now, what's going on on this side is what we can do at CAMS. So we can't help children meet their basic needs. We can't help children feel safe. We can't help children really developing in their friendships and families because this is all about what's going on at home 24-7. You know, it's very unlikely that a child with massive trust issues who's had loads of professionals coming in and out of their life are going to want to meet another professional and meet with them for an hour a week. 
that sort of work can take years and years and years, and if they haven't got a really good attachment with somebody outside of therapy, I then become their attachment figure, and finishing with me is taking them right back down to the bottom again, and really, really traumatised. When I say traumatised, bedwetting, soiling, you know, it can be, the children who don't feel safe, they regress, and they really, really, you know, struggle with their basic functions. So, ideally, this is all going on with school, caregivers, social workers, friends. Up here, when we're thinking a bit more about the limbic system, when we're looking a bit more at emotional regulation, behavioural regulation, we're looking at maybe self-esteem, confidence, this is more social community groups. What do you think children, I mean, why do you think children would need things like activities and um, why do you think they might need to learn skills in this area? Just thinking about the, like their internal working model. It's a really hard question, actually. Well, basically, children need to learn mastery over things. So it's about breaking things down into little chunks, doing things that they love, that they can achieve, and making sure they achieve them, so that they can then take the step onto something else. Because children who experience shame are so terrified of humiliation, they're not going to try anything that's outside their comfort zone. So I think you'll find at schools, just even getting them to do a new task is really tricky because they're like, I'm going to fail. What can I do to just, to, I know, I'm going to affect the way that you feel. I'm going to, I'm going to, how can I do this? I'll run from the room, I'll create disruption, anything I can to avoid doing the task. So we need to teach them self-esteem. And this is by them getting mastery over things. Things like karate, climbing, really, really good for children with trauma. Is build self-esteem. Once we've got to here and children have developed enough self-esteem and they've got enough resilience, enough resources, then we can start looking at this well, Maslow, passions, creativity, morality, problem solving. For CAMS, we're looking at trauma-focused therapy. So we need to have all these things in place before we can really get involved properly and do that individual work. So when people come to us and go, oh my goodness, this child is so traumatized, we need we need this child to have therapy. They need to talk about what's happened to them. They can't make, they don't have the words to say what's happened. They can't make sense of what has happened. And they haven't got the resilience or the resources to process trauma because it's too painful because they haven't gone through all of this first. So we risk re-traumatizing children by doing therapy before they're ready. So, what does this mean? So we need to put, we need, very often in CAMS we will get involved in the children, certainly the children in care, get involved with developmental trauma at the bottom of the triangle, but it will be through consultation. Or we run groups around supporting trauma care, therapeutic parenting groups. So we do a foster care as one, and we also do um, ones for kinship care and parents. So parents who've experienced adverse childhood experiences themselves, and their children have too. So we often join up the professional network and make sure everyone's working in the same way. Because if we're all working from the same part of the brain, we all need to be doing the same thing. If a child is in their brainstem and they're constantly in fight, flight, freeze and they don't feel safe, we all need to be working with brainstem partners. School, CAMS, social care, at home, we all need to be doing the same things to regulate that child to help them to feel safe. If they're all about Behavioural, we all need to be working in the same way, okay? And that helps the child move up through the different stages of development. So we'll often do a really enhanced mission assessment at CAMS. I might close straight away, but give loads of advice and do some consultation. Or I'll keep it open because it's such a tricky case that everyone needs uh, network support over, over time to build safety in the network. Because actually dealing with these children is really frightening. They're really confusing, they're really challenging, they make you feel like the worst person in the world. You know, they can be really hard to work with. They don't feel safe, they make you not feel safe. <laughs> they don't feel safe and they feel rubbish, they make you feel rubbish. So often supporting the network and containing their anxieties is just as important as working with the children. Because we need to keep the caregivers safe. We need to make sure that their cup is full. Um, okay, that's enough. Oh, just thinking very quickly, when we do this, we do a developmental history, and this is where we can make sense about 
the difference between developmental trauma and neurodevelopmental disorders. So autism, ADHD, they are neurodevelopmental disorders. They're all about the wiring of the brain. They're often in pregnancy. There's a difference. One is trauma related. Um, there's it's still kind of a blurry area, and it's not my specialty, the difference between in pregnancy, but we would know the difference in their presentation as they're, after they're born and throughout their development. And we can see that. So when we are, I get a case sometimes where it's, as you said earlier, it's so tricky and it's really hard to unpick, and this child is presenting like they're autistic and they're ADHD, but we know there's masses and masses and masses of trauma. So it needs really, really careful unpicking that developmental history, the chronology, uh, reports from school, going and observing schools, getting everybody involved and really thinking about these children so we can unpick really carefully and work out what's what. Often, it's neither one or the other, very often it's both. Uh, so it's about providing safety, love and belonging. Dan Hughes created DDP, Dyadic Developmental Psychotherapy. He's is the PACE model that we use in therapeutic parenting. Playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy. He originally created it as PLACE, which was playfulness, love, acceptance, curiosity and empathy. He took out the love because he thought it sounded wishy-washy. Actually, it's so important because when we're dealing with developmental trauma, it's all about connection, it's all about trust, it's all about relationship. You can't have that without love. So, people that are referred to CAMS, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, and it's very much about that with developmental trauma. We're looking at everybody in the child's community to be able to support them in this long journey. But it, it, there is light at the end of the tunnel for trauma, developmental trauma. But with brain plasticity, we can rewire children's brains. They do not have to remain like this. They do not have to end up with personality disorder or mental health problems. We can help them. Unlike neurodevelopmental disorders that are, you're not going to change those. You can support them and manage them, but you're not going to change them. Mm -hmm. Attachment and trauma, we can, we have some way of, of changing the outcome. So it's not a cut and dry case. So building positive relationships. I use PACE with my parents and carers. I model it constantly. I hope that um, they feel safer because of that and they're able to be a more therapeutic caregiver in response. Hopefully I self-soothe and I'm able to regulate my emotions so that they do too and then they can pass that on. And we're always looking for that unconditional positive regard. You know, even if you have to put in a consequence for these children, you know, natural consequence is a natural consequence. If this happens, this happens. But, oh my goodness, that's tough, isn't it? And do you know what, no matter what's happened here, we're okay. They've got a connection before correction. And I think if you can hold on to that, that's a really powerful way of looking at how you might manage behaviour. Boundaries with empathy, connection before correction, and thinking about that emotional regulation. If you go out all the way with anything today, those three things are really important on X. Playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. So activities, hobbies, anything that creates mastery, this is the self-esteem. Um, you want to build a child's self-esteem. It's not about external validation. It doesn't matter how many times you tell a child who's experienced developmental trauma has got, you know, attachment issues, you're amazing. They're not going to believe you. In actual fact, it probably undermines everything else you say. And it might undermine the trust in the relationship. So maybe saying, oh, I saw you did that and it was hard, but you did it anyway. Guessing you're pretty proud of yourself. That's giving them self esteem. It's not your validation, it's about how they view themselves. That's really important. So, noticing an attentive language is better. You know, noticing their value, they're, they're, you know, they're worthy of noticing them. They're worthy of you thinking about them. Oh, I was thinking about you. Yeah, oh, you kept me in mind. I must be important enough for that. Maybe I don't have to use all these strategies to keep myself in mind. So, using creativity, very powerful at being able to create a metaphor or a story that says more than a thousand words, the words that they don't have. 
helps to link things together. Oh my goodness, there's so much I could go on and on and on. If you, know, if you want any more support about this, please do. I'll get my card out at the end. But there's so much that we can do. A mastery and pressure builds efficacy. It builds self-esteem much more than words ever can. And trust, predictability, actions, actions more than words. I think we're nearly there. So when you come to CAMS, when it's appropriate, we will do things like on the trauma <coughs> pathway, the trauma pathway, the developmental trauma pathway, psychotherapy when it's appropriate, when children have got the words, uh, EMDR, trauma focused CBT, art therapy, play therapy, family therapy, group, and then nurturing attachment group. That is the trauma care group that we've developed, which helps parents and carers to support their children 24-7 helps them, helps them to feel like their cup is full enough to be able to support their little ones. You know, it's really important, especially, you know, we all work, we all work in an environment that is really challenging and we work with kids that are really, really hard and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of secondary trauma and just as much as it's important for parents to look after themselves, it's really vital that professionals look after themselves too. Because, you know, the, the drive, the push, is to care. And if you're not careful, when you're stressed, that can be compulsive caregiving. And that goes, you know, you're not putting yourself first. Think of that Jenga again. All those bits been taken out of the bottom and given to everyone else. It's going to fall over, it's going to crash, you're going to crash and burn out. So, keeping yourself safe, meditation, yoga, walking, doing things you love, being with friends, connection, 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 art. All these things to keep yourself safe so you can help parents or so you can help the children that you work with. I'm kind of rambling, sorry. Um, this is just more of that, really. How do I put this into practice? Can everyone see that? Yeah, can you read it okay? Struggling at the back. We've got basics, belonging, learning, coping, recall self. So working up through the brain again, but instead of going up, it's going sideways. Good enough housing, enough money to live, being safe, access and transport, all the social care stuff. Belonging, this is I suppose where the carers come in. Helping a child feel like they belong. Helping a child feel like they know their place in the world, it makes sense to them. <coughs> Keeping relationships going. Focusing on good times and places. Making sense of where the child's come from making friends, mixing with other children, learning, engaging mentors for children, mapping out career or life plan, helping the child to organise himself, highlighting achievements, developing life skills. Um, I'm going to finish in a minute, so I think we'll have the next one. Yes, the next one. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, coping, being brave, solving problems, understanding boundaries. Boundaries people tend to associate with discipline. Boundaries are about structure. Boundaries are about respect. Boundaries, if you use empathy with a boundary, so I get this is really tough. Um, you know, bedtime is at nine o'clock, eight o'clock, and you know you want to stay up, I know you want to see me because you know you're not feeling safe up there, but actually you are safe. I'm here, you're okay. I'll say that to someone, I'll just go back earlier. Fostering interest, calming down, self-soothing, that emotional regulation stuff. Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's a clean slate. Lean on others. The ability to elicit care. The ability to trust enough that you can make yourself vulnerable enough to ask for what you need without coercively getting someone to meet your needs. And then up here with the core self, that very much the neocortex, instilling a sense of hope, supporting the child to understand other people's feelings, Helping the child to know herself or himself, taking responsibility. These are all things that you can't possibly do down here. These are things very much that you can do after quite a lot of work has been done around those foundations. Okay, there are tried and tested treatments for specific problems, use them, but when it's appropriate. I think that might be it, but it's pretty much this. So if relationships and things developmentally can go wrong, their relationships are where they're most likely to be. At the end. <laughs>